Welcome back again. Sorry we rushed you in a little bit, a little bit earlier than we expected, but on the other hand, we're going to have a very, very interesting speaker. You all know about Sydney, if you, many of you have probably heard him speak, so I will make only a very short introduction, and I will limit, limit myself to two quotes, or two or three quotes that he, uh, um, out of his rich list of quotations. The, um, he once said, oh, the, the, he, he had one of his famous quotes is about knowledge and ignorance, and I like it for many reasons, but he said, a lot of things that have been accomplished in science have been accomplished on the basis of ignorance, in the sense that you import into science people from outside, because once you have an established science, it has got its high priests, the guys who know everything and will work, uh, that will work and that will not work. And they don't want to be bothered, so you have to have a challenge. And the great thing is that young people are ignorant, and we should catch them before they turn into the priesthood. So I think that science has a, uh, should have a much more daring approach. Another f version of almost the same thing, but more in the spirit of Paralimas is, the best people to push science forward are those who come from outside it. Emigres are always best at making new discoveries. And finally, I think it is the greatest adventure in the world to really know at a given point that you're the only person in the world that knows something new. That is a thrill that's worth it. And I know that Sidney Brenner has been through this many times, and so I'm very happy to give the word to you, Sidney. Uh, <clears throat> This is going to be a rather strange talk because I'm going to connect up the problems of causal analysis with something that has become quite popular these days, and that is the question of reduction in science, reduction in everything. Now, of course, the great uh, newspaper, the Manchester Guardian in England, was famous for its misprints. And it uh, once referred to a, a famous theoretical physicist as a theatrical physicist, and also often called <coughs> nuclear physics unclear physics. <laughs> In much the same way, it once made the misprint of causal into casual, which is, as you realize, almost exactly the opposite. So that all of these things are related in a strange way, and it is our uh, and it is this analysis which we really try to dissect out what can be done from what, uh, from what can't be done, or what does not need to be done is even more important. When we lived in a world uh, which was, just to give it its uh, epitome, the Newtonian world of physics, where everything was on our scale, that scale of time, space like this, it was very easy to discern what were causes and what were effects, uh, because everything was a linear progression. Of course, everybody realizes, notwithstanding some rather strange schools of history, that in fact causes must come before the effect. They must precede the change. There are many historian things who believe that it is the effect that brings out the cause, which follows afterwards. Uh, but I won't bother you with that, because that means changing time around. 
But when, of course, we move to extremes of size, the very large, the very small, uh, things don't look as clear any longer. And indeed, when we move to things away from the simple connection, connection of bodies colliding with each other, when we move to what I shall call more complex objects, consisting of many parts, it is becomes extremely difficult to decide what are the causes uh, of, of this. And so biology and quite a lot of engineering falls into this second, to the second strange uh, uh, complex organization where there's a lot of components and there's nothing that can be decided to be uh, the cause because it is a concerted thing. And of course, that gave rise in physics to a completely new branch of physics, statistical physics. That is, when there are lots and lots of components, you cannot trace the exact parts of every particle as it collides and calculate, if you like, the outcome you must use a much more global analysis. And statistical physics and, of course, biology, which follows on that, uh, is, of course, where we have to make a large uh, effort to see uh, what is the outcome of very complicated pieces of, of physical objects put in, as indeed if you take a, an aeroplane with 100,000 components, all of which have to be correctly connected and must work well, then what do we describe that uh, as, uh, how do we discern this. The other problem is that we ourselves are animals that actually can act independently, that is, we have subjective wills, and we can try and change things by ourselves. And of course we know that you can't change things by just wishing for them to change, you have to have actions that cause them to change. So this entire uh, area of complex objects, machines, biological organisms, and collections of biological organisms is an area of science which I think is in quite a bit of confusion in terms of what our explanatory theories are going to be uh, composed of. So let us begin by looking at something which is very important and which begins to, to say uh, which will begin the analysis. If I take a bacterium, now this is a small object, it's about a micron, that is a micro, micrometer in linear dimensions, and it is the total volume, just remember the thing, the femtoliter. That is, its volume 
is one micron cubed. It is a femtoliter. Now, inside such a bacterium, which uh, you can see, are at least 4,000 different components, 2,000 different components, which have to interact in a given way in order that the functions uh, be preserved. Of course, if you are used to the way humans organize complexity, you will immediately start to think about a supervisor, a general manager, someone who decides this is what's going to happen, and that's how, how it's going to happen, and this is your job. You also have to think of how you're going to assemble all of these components. <laughs> and with our type of thinking, we want a very, we will go immediately, intuitively, if you like, to a hierarchical system. There will be managers, they will speak to under managers. Uh, just look at anything, how things are run today. This university, any organization, there are people at the top and then there are deputies and there are people below and then everything is, is organized according to a program. Now, of course, if one says, where is the program? Where does it reside? Uh, you come to a great difficulty because unlike many things, as you will learn very soon, there are no supervisors. Let's just take a bacteria. One of the most interesting things about it is that at this scale, the movement of, of molecules by simple diffusion, just by their own uh, movement, because the thing is not frozen, that is so fast that it will populate all states very quickly. And if we take the scale of time for which you want reactions to occur, then you will find that most chemical reactions take about a millisecond, a, m a thousandth of a second. And that's how the bacteria can divide, make itself, build itself in 20, 30 minutes, divide again, and set off to bacteria. So who is controlling that? Who is giving the orders? Where are this? And one of the most important things is that at that scale, there's nobody. There's nobody in charge. There's nobody lining up this to go to that. Each enzyme has a task. Its substrate uh, binds to it simply by chance. That is, most of the time, the substrate is hitting the wrong, time, the wrong molecule. And most of the time, it hits the wrong molecule, the right molecule. It hits it in the wrong place. So only a small fraction of these random interactions become solidified, so to speak, and then the action takes place. We do not need to direct it. There is no assembly plant. And you can therefore understand how such symptoms, systems are built simply out of the enormously high number of molecular collisions in such a small space. If we go to an animal cell, cell in your body, for example, 
you find that that is 10 times larger on the linear scale, which means it's a thousand times bigger on the volume scale. Now, everything will not work that way. The collisions become much less frequent. And so you begin to find then that there is partitioning, that there are special molecules which carry other molecules around and move them much faster than they would move just by random diffusion. And it is a remarkable fact that when you think about, when you look at synapses, which is the way your neurons connect in the network, the volume of the synapse is about a femtoliter. It has about a thousand components. But what you know already, you don't have to organize anything in there. Molecular collisions will ensure that things take place within the right order of time. So biology has exploited in many ways in order to get off the ground, if you like, a simple statistical uh, pathway, which again leads after time to an effect, the cell divides, and so this can be repeated. But there is no supervisory program. All right. Now you can show that as complexity increases in such a system, as people learned very early by trying to get computers to do things, uh, you learn that the system cannot be run in the normal way. Uh, for example, uh, many years ago, there was a project to take a computer and let it guide itself. You put it on wheels and you then let it guide itself in a room with obstructions. Right? And now the first experiment was the following and this becomes very important. That is, they gave the computer a map of the room they told that two solid objects can't occupy the same space. So they said, you find a path and execute that path. Now, the way the computer moved was it had wheels, and the wheels were run by stepping motors. So it would calculate, I have to make so many pulses to this wheel so many pulses to those wheels in order to move it here, then I must turn the machine and move it to the next place. And of course, what they discovered is the machine drove itself out of the window, basically. Right. The reason being that these, there are inaccuracies. Things are not exact at this level. There are all sorts of physical reasons and computational reasons why you can't do it by, as it's called, dead reckoning. You can't do it by dead reckoning. And what was found, and the longer the process is that you have to pass through, the more you'll get off the narrow path, the more the system will collapse. And what they discovered very quickly is they had to give the computer senses. Okay. Gave it eyes and said, when you're in this position, use your eyes and check that you are in this. And if you're not in exact place, adjust yourself and then proceed. Once you have senses, 
that can do the refinement, then you can execute very complex things. But you cannot, under, under any circumstances, grow a nerve exactly from this point to another point, then make it turn right and go down to find its end organ. It has to be a, a, a thing where everything has to be checked and a global picture must come out at the end. So that once we remove from complex objects the idea of a supervisor who's going to check that everything is done, then we have to compensate it by internal rules. And that is done both in machines and also in biology for certain. It is done by this business of self-adjusting. And of course, sailors in the early days knew that you couldn't do things by dead reckoning because there were currents in the ocean, which means a lot of people lost their way and uh, never quite got to where they were going to do. So now let us ask ourselves, in such systems, which then operate by feedback, the old idea of Norbert Wiener, that is regulation, not by this, but by adjustment, so that we actually can point by point work it out. What is the causal structure of that? What is the movement? How can we describe it? Uh, we all know that for things like the weather, for example, you want to know what causes a hurricane in somewhere in America, it could be, it could be just the fact that someone traveling in a boat uh, threw a cigarette off the end of the boat. This is the famous thing of the electron at the end of the universe, which is in just a fluctuation, then gets amplified through all of these steps in order to generate a hurricane. So the primal cause of a hurricane could be trivial. Of course, the conditions must be satisfied. Now, I've raised all these things in detail because we would like to say, how would we actually come to understand how these complex objects work. And you can take anything in human affairs. They are these levels of complexity that we have. And of course, if we take objects like biological objects, which uh, uh, satisfy certain criteria by mere existence, then how can we come to explain their, their, uh, uh, their the steady state of occupation and the fact that they can repeat these things? Of course, since the early days, it was thought we could explain everything by calculating everything. And Laplace believed that you could just, all you had to do is know the positions and the uh, directions of motion of all the particles, and you could then calculate the universe, if you like. Now, of course, that, apart from the fact that it's a very expensive way of doing it, still begs the question of can we 
take any level of organization and reduce it to its components. It doesn't make sense to take an organism like a bacterium and reduce it to its genes, let us say, or its proteins. And many people do not believe in reductionism. They argue that as you have a level, you get something totally new. Now, the claim of reducibility then has disappeared. And they claim then that the system has properties which, cannot, which are irreducible. That is, the system itself has, has to be explained. And so what is now being called system biology, it's, uh, it's now became very popular as anti-reductionist stance oh, for the last, uh, I would say, 30 years. And people were saying, no, we have to explain something by this, uh, so that at a certain level of complexity, there are new phenomena. But you see, when we say we can explain things by reduction, what we mean is not that we can explain them by the properties of the reduced elements. We mean we can explain it by the properties of the components and their interactions. So it is the interactions between what the objects we reduce it that give the system new properties. Many of these, as you know, are statistical. Many of these are so-called emergence, which is a word you should never use. If something is there, it doesn't have to emerge. It may just emerge in your head. But if something is there, it is the properties of the system. And they will curtail how the elements will be put together. Now, that, I think, says we must still go for reductionist uh, view because we explain there was nobody who comes. There may be engineers that construct machines and we can go back to the factory and see what they did. And they caused all these pieces to be put together that way. And sometimes they are wrong, as we well know. They put them together the wrong way, or not well enough together. So, but when we come to biology, there was nobody there. Nobody there. It is the evolution that has brought this each ascending level of complexity. And so, although it doesn't make sense to say, I will take human beings and reduce them to their uh, components. Uh, that doesn't make sense. Uh, Wigner wrote, the physicist Wigner wrote a paper many years ago in which he pointed out there were insufficient uh, equations in quantum mechanics to explain living matter. And he has a footnote in this article which says, perhaps this is where consciousness becomes important. But I pointed out in the audience that Wigner, with his Hungarian accent, and his nice blue suit, they were not made that way. They were not condensations 
of quantum mechanical particles. What happened is Daddy Wigner and Mommy Wigner got into bed one night and uh, Eugene Wigner was made that way. So we don't have to explain how Wigner's uh, are made out of the quantum theory of their elementary particles. And that, I think, has now become a very important thing, is as we transcend each level of organization in the cell, from single cell to multiple cell, to organisms, to complex organisms. We don't have to explain uh, everything by going back to the original uh, structure of matter or of time, but we explain things by the behavior of the level below. It is enough to explain psychology on the structure of brains. You don't even need synapses to do this. Right? And I think that that is why the unified science will come to exist for the simple reason that this great demand of making everything fundamental is that uh, will be satisfied that one man's fundamental object is another man's complex structure. And I think all we have to understand is how all of this came into existence, not because there was somebody up there who said, let there be light and took six days to make everything, that just isn't true. Never happened like that. That's just some primitive people who didn't even have science. And that's the way they thought how the world was made, just as the way someone might use a tool to make something else. So I think that we don't have to list all the causes. The causes could be many. They could be almost imperceptible. The, what tips the balance could be a small fluctuation that would get multiplied through many effects. We have to know, I think, how the various levels are organized. What is their capability? What is it they can do? And then I think we can start to look at a science for what I think is needed in the world, which is the science for our interactions as human beings and for the organization we create and what we want them to do. So I think the sciences of which exist now of sociology and economics are still in a very primitive state compared to the big developments in biology and I foresee that that is going to have to be a very important uh, part of the scientific uh, order of the next century in order that we come to understand that, uh, that the th uh, what are the interactions and what do they lead to and what do they do. Uh, so, uh, I think that reducibility, reduction is still a very important thing in the physical world that we inhabit, at least our bodies inhabit, our connection with physics 
and chemistry is real. And that is what has led to this great revolution in the biological sciences. But whether we can reduce social interaction, we can probably reduce social interaction very easily in insect societies and in other things. That's easy. But I think where you have the actors themselves who can understand what's going on, then I think we have a new kind of science. So, so you may think this has not been causal analysis, it has been casual analysis of what is a, a problem that I don't think exists any more in biology as a real, as a real issue. Uh, of course we want to know causes, but, but the only causes we want to know are those that can be treated. Uh, we don't want to know causes that we cannot operate on. So you want to know which part of a complex system you can change by putting in something else. I think there are going to be difficulties in doing lots of things, as we've already learned in medicine, that uh, it's not easy in a complex system where there are many, many interactions to decide that's what we need to do. So I leave you with that. If there are any questions, which I'm sure there are, I'll try and answer them, which I'm sure I'll be unable to. Thank you very much for your reflections. I would be curious what you think in that case about the education process and the process of learning and bringing people from youngsters into science and particularly into the kinds of science then that also require the sociology, psychology, not only the hard science, but more broadly. Yeah. No, I think the, I think the education side is tremendously important. And see, what I think you can, if you look at the world of biology at least, and of science in general, over the last, uh, since the last World War, since the middle of the last century, 70 years, you'll find that every single major advance has taken, was produced either by single individuals or by very small groups operating in open structures like Bell Labs. If you do the historical analysis, and all these gigantic institutions, they built an atom bomb, true, and a hydrogen bomb. But basically, they didn't do anything that was novel or unique. You know, they ground through it. So the most important thing is to have just some independence of for certain number of people. Now, of course, today, you see, we have a big, we have a big operation against the word, what is called, has been called curiosity-driven science. That is, 
every, and the, I've never used that word because I realized that since Mrs. Thatcher's day, every politician will put the word idle in front of curiosity. No, just idle curiosity. See, science is not curiosity driven. It is question driven. It is to answer questions. We do research to solve problems, not to just dabble in something. Now, of course, where the, what people have to learn is that sometimes and very often the problem exists in the wrong form. And by turning it on its head sometimes, or even out of mistaken view of it, suddenly you can see there is a new way to approach these things. And I think that is great. It, if you study the history of many of the big changes, that is the most important thing. Now, today, of course, uh, all of science has to operate on, on not out of doing questions like this. Uh, Medawa called it the art of the soluble. That is, science is what you can solve. You can't do science on things where the problem is in undefined just saying there is a problem. But you must be able to formulate the problem and then it's, then I think you can get a co completely different way of looking at it. And of course there has always been among scientists this great debate that goes forwards and backwards is of applied science, uh, you know, uh, and, and applicable science. Uh, someone once said that the difference between the applied and the applicable is the same as the difference between the despised and the despicable. But still, it's... Uh, and I've come to the conclusion that the only way forward in the present world is to do both. And so, many years ago, I founded a new thing, which I'll tell you about very quickly. It's very simple. It's called the Casino Fund. That's very... Yes, I gave lectures on it in America. Now, I'll tell you what is the casino fund. The casino fund is everybody who gives money for research, gives 1% to the casino fund. Who runs the casino fund? You give it to people like me. Let me pick the people. Let me pick the problems. We don't have any peer review. That's nonsense. And we don't have any of this. And tell the people who are investing money in research for getting their returns, focus on the 99%. Do that with what you like, because I think the 1% could be really catalytic. And you don't want it to be justified by what is called peer review. Uh, my definition of peer review is you take the guy out to the end of the Atlantic City pier <laughs> and you put his feet in concrete blocks and you push him over and you review whether he sinks or floats. That's peer review. So I don't think, I think if, 
we can follow this. And one thing is that if you have something like this, the young people find you. There's a network. Their networks are much more important than all this other rubbish, you know, Facebook and nonsense. The young people have networks of family schools, you know, contemporaneous things. They will find you. And it's worthwhile doing because most people who invest money in science are prepared to lose 90% of it. They just want a tenfold gain on the other 10%. That's their form of gambling. So that's what they're doing. And I got this because a venture capitalist said to me, he said, you know, 90% of what we do fails. It's a Californian venture capitalist. And he says, and I have to waste valuable executive time looking after the failures. I said, I solve your problem. Give me the money. I declare myself a failure. Don't bother to come. Look after the other nine guys and do your thing there. That's the partitioning. So this is what I think these... These big advances are small fluctuations, small steps made by tiny numbers of people. They can't be generated where everybody thinks the same and where the problem is. So you just need that, and it's good to embed them inside organization like universities and do this. And, but the most important thing is that they carry the complete responsibility. If they succeed, that becomes very important for them. And if they fail, they find jobs doing something else. Most of the people will not, not be able to do it. But if you get one person who in 10 years' time might change everything we're doing, it's worth it. It's worth it. So I've become a great proponent for the split thing. That is, let other people get over the activation barriers. Let a few people try to tunnel through them. To just to give you an analogy. Sorry, to, it's a long answer. It's a very short answer. And we rely on human talent. That's all. Do we have another question, Sydney? Other question? The gentleman in the back. The airline industry. Oh, the airline industry is perhaps uh, one of the most complex uh, man-made uh, systems. But if you look at it, uh, it's perhaps one of the uh, systems which has the least amount of errors, though in spite of whatever people might think. Uh, this is actually mentioned by uh, Sid Matthew in his book, uh, Black Box Thinking. Now, the, 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 the reason why such a complex industry appears to have the least amount of, uh, say, errors and so on is attributed to the fact that of finding the problem, learning from mistakes. Whenever an error happens, they go down to the basic, to every bit in order to identify. And they do it not by, as you rightly pointed out, not a reductionary approach, taking every piece out, but rather in a holistic way, and then focusing on where the problem happened, why it happened, and so forth. Not who is responsible. It's not about witch hunt. It's not about finding who is to be blamed. 
And on the basis of that problem, they keep on improving and improving and improving, and hence, uh, close to perfection. They're not perfect yet as an industry, a complex industry, where they're able to achieve high levels of uh, uh, standards. So perhaps that industry offers something for the management of complex systems in general, and something which we could look at. And uh, Sid Matthew actually contrasts that with the health industry and shows how the health industry, uh, healthcare industry, is really so far backward. Thank you. Just a comment. Mm -hmm. It's called refinement. <laughs> Other comments or questions? Brian. Hello. <laughs> I'm wondering what you think of the idea that every scientific project that's proposed, say, for... Does this work? Okay. Uh, there's an idea prevalent in Europe and now in Singapore that scientific projects that are proposed for funding should have a payoff to the public within five years. And I, I wonder, Sorry, I can't hear. Okay. There is an idea that's around in Europe and in Singapore now that scientific projects that are proposed should have a payoff to the public in some form or yeah. another within five years. I wonder what you make of that. That's what's called applied science, not curiosity. There should be a payoff. Yes, they say that. I think that's fine. That's fine. But, and I think that there is a, you know, there's a contract between the public and so on, who pay for all of this and expect some return. Though not often the way they get it. But I think, I don't think you need to do that with all of science. I think that most of it can be done that way, by incremental improvement, by finding better products and so on. And all I'm saying is that invention, novelty, innovation can't be done under those constraints because sometimes you have to go back to the drawing board and start again from building something. So I think it, it's just a matter of trying to take a diverse population of people with different talents and trying to find the rather rare people that could, because of just the way they have in looking at things, lead to innovation. I'm not sure that uh, you can, you can, you know, do this. And they have to be, they have to volunteer. <coughs> they have to volunteer. And the, that is, they have to feel the drive themselves. If it's not there, you're wasting your time. You might as well send them off to work in some other organization. But there are people who have that ability, to have the, the questioning ability. And I think they will be the, the ones who change, who have the capacity to change society. Any other questions to Sydney? If not, then I think we should think, thank him once more. Oh, yes. It's quite heavy, but it's... Oh.
Oh, it's a hand. It's a hand. It's a thumb up. I thought it was a girl with <laughs> four backs. Good also. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay.